All right, thanks, Santi, so much. I mean, I'm so just in awe and so just blessed to see, like, you guys worshiping our God as we're just singing how God has been faithful in our life, how he's been good. Uh, I know some of your guys' stories. I know some of the things that you guys are going through, um, particularly this, this year. And to see some of you guys singing that, saying, God, you've been faithful, you've been good, is just a blessing to me uh, and, and just speaks volumes to how good our God is. So uh, that's just amazing for me to, to see. Uh, hey, if you're, if you're new here and this is your first time, or maybe this is a day in which you're kind of returning. I know I met a couple of, talked to a couple of you guys here today who's like, you're returning to high school. I'm super glad that you guys are here. Uh, I hope that you guys would continue to come back. I know next week we're not gonna be here, but I hope you guys would continue to come back and just experience what we, what we have for you guys. So uh, yeah, just wanna say welcome. Again, my name's Connor. If, if I haven't met you, any of you guys new, uh, new students here yet. So yeah, I'm super glad to be here with you guys. I haven't been here uh, with you guys in a while, so it's, it's been a minute. Um, and like Henty said, we're in this sermon series called Advent, right, where we're talking about not only the arrival of Jesus, how he was born into this world, uh, because that happened before today, but we're also celebrating that Jesus is going to come back, that he's going to come back and he is going to take all of his people who are followers of him with him to heaven. That's a beautiful day that's to come, and that's what we're here to celebrate as well. And so far in the series, we've talked about the first week, if you guys remember, how Jesus is the light in the darkness. Henty talked about that. And we also talked about last week, Henty spoke about how Jesus is a gift for the humble. Okay, so we've talked about who Jesus is in multiple different ways. And today again, we're going to talk about how Jesus is not only the light in the darkness, a gift for the humble, but Jesus actually desires to be in a relationship with you, to be present in your life and show up in your life and cause change. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, how many of you guys have have received some kind of a nickname for something like, whether it be awkward or weird that you've done in your life? How many of you guys have like a nickname that people call you because of something you did? Okay, now, sub-question, how many of you are willing to share that, that nickname and why that happened? Yeah, what, what was the nickname you had? Spicy. Okay. What, why, why do people call you spicy? Um, I used to eat handfuls of salsa as a child. Oh. Okay, fair. Handfuls of salsa. I can see why they would call you spicy. And now, now you don't even eat it. You're like, I don't even like it, but people still call me spicy. Right, uh, one more. Who's, who else? All right, right here. Twinkle toes. Oh, okay. Why? You're just like dancing out there on the, like the football field. Like, come on, get your head in the game. Come on. We're, that's funny. That's good. Yeah, that, that's great, right? I, I know for myself, I've, I've had a couple nicknames over the years. One of them, this may sound really weird, but Scrub Muffin. Okay, Scrub Muffin. That's what my cousin, he like calls a certain amount of people in our family. And for some reason, I'm one of those people. Honestly, there's no experience behind it. He just says like, oh, hey, what's up, Scrub Muffin? It's kind of funny. Uh, I've also been called Dumbo. I got like these massive ears. Like I almost take flight sometimes. Uh, and like people have called me Dumbo before, right? We receive these nicknames uh, because of things that, that we do. I know that there's somebody in particular sitting here in this room. I wasn't on this trip from Mississippi, uh, but I heard of somebody here who may have eaten like a tub. I'm talking like a tub of coleslaw. And now there's this like name being thrown around like Slaw Daddy. I hear there's a, a Slaw Daddy in this room. Pretty, pretty crazy, right? Yeah, I'm looking over somewhere, <clears throat> this side of the room. Uh, anyways, right, we receive these names. A lot of you guys, it's like, yeah, I have a nickname myself. And we receive these names because of typically things that we have done or experiences that we've been through. And so people are like, oh, yep, this is what we're, we're calling you from now on. You know, names are given to us for multiple different reasons in life, but mainly, again, because of particular things that either we've fulfilled, we've done, or have happened to us that stick forever. And this morning, as we look at our passage, just as we've been singing that first song that, that God, you have a thousand names that we can sing praises to you, we're going to see in a similar way how Jesus himself has names that were given to him. Names that were given to him because of things that he did and fulfilled. Names that were actually given to him hundreds of years before he was even born, but that were given to him because of what he did and who he was known for. 
And so today, as we unpack this passage, we're going to see how Jesus shows up in our life in multiple different ways as these names, as these roles, and actually desires to change us as a result of believing that of who Jesus is and seeing that show up in our life. So a question I'm going to ask you guys as we go uh, it throughout this morning is going to be along the lines of this. Do you here believe Jesus to be who he is in your life today? Do you truly believe Jesus to be who he is and who he was proved to be in your life today? So I'm going to ask that in a multiple different ways, multiple different formats as we go on. But if you, if you guys have your Bibles with you uh, or your phones, whatever you guys use to go into God's word. We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. This was already on the screen for worship, which is great. I love how we just are really honing in on this passage this morning. So Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. And then we're actually going to land this morning in Luke chapter 2, verses 10 through 14. So just keep that in the back of your mind. I'll bring it back up, but we're going to land there this morning as we see how these two passages couple Together, So let's go to God's word, God's word and see what it has to say this morning. Isaiah 9, verse 6 says, For us, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and up to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's pray really quick before we continue on. God, we just come before you right now. And God, I just humbly ask that uh, these students here and all of us here would see your word as the most prominent thing this morning. God, that they would know more about who you are and how you desire to show up in their life. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work in our hearts and give us attentiveness uh, to just know you and know what your word has for us this morning. So I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now, like I said, my goal for us this morning is to unpack these, right, there's really four key names in this passage that, that bring us hope and challenge us. I hope that we will be challenged to, to see one way, at least one way, in which we need Jesus more in our life today, moving forward. Now, I want to hop right into the, the first name here, because our, our first point this morning, our first truth that we can pull from this passage is simply that Jesus counsels us in all wisdom. Jesus is our wonderful counselor, right? That's the first name that Isaiah Again, this is 800, this is about 800 years before Jesus is even born. He says, this baby shall be called Wonderful Counselor. You know, I was on the phone with uh, Apple support uh, a couple months ago. I had this like bill that randomly like showed up on my phone. And obviously, right, when you don't know how to fix this, the problem yourself, you have to like call somebody and like get help. And so I couldn't figure it out myself. So I had to call uh, Apple support. Um, and, and I get a hold of, like, the initial, like, the, the initial, I don't even know what they're called, just the person who picks up the phone. And I, like, explain to them the issue, and they're like, okay, understand, like, yeah, let me try to fix this. And they try to help out, and it doesn't solve my problem. They, they weren't equipped to help me. And so what do they do? They naturally, like, after trying to solve the whole thing, like, restart the phone, all that stuff, uh, they send me off to, like, tech support. And so I get to tech support. I explain to them my issue again. They're, they try to fix it. And like, oh, yeah, this will solve it. I'm like, nope, sorry, it didn't, it didn't work. I'm like, oh, okay. Like, yeah, like, this is, this is probably a job for Billings. So then they send me over to Billings. So now I'm talking to, like, some Billings person, and they're, like, trying to resolve the problem again. And the same thing happens. It's like, oh, sorry, like, I, I don't actually have, like, the equipment. I don't actually know, you know, how to solve this answer after, like, they tried to solve it the whole time. And then they send me to, like, tech support level two. Like, by this time, I'm practically talking to Tim Cook, I feel like. I'm, like, on the phone with, like, the deep, like, in the depths of Apple. And, like, I just go through all these different layers, and I'm constantly trying to get help, but keep coming across people, because it took forever for, to get this, like, little tiny bill to get fixed. And, and I kept coming across these people who just were not equipped, who, who weren't actually 
prepared and like didn't know what they were talking about, trying to give me help and solve this issue. And it just, it was like two hours on the phone, like crazy amount of time. You know, in a, in a similar way in this world, there, there's so many times that, that we have struggles, that we have difficulties, that we go to places in this world, whether it be people or organizations, almost the same as like I was going to Apple Support, and we go to these places in the world that aren't actually equipped to handle our struggles. Right? I think of like social media, right? When, when we're struggling with see, our appearance and how we look, we go to things like social media to, to solve the issue, right? Social media tells us, and we believe in this world, that it tells us how we should look, how we should appear, how we should portray ourselves. We, I think of things like friends at school, right? Community groups at school that tell us when we're struggling with uh, our worth or our self-status or, or who we ought to be in school, we go to our friends and we listen to them and the advice that they have, like, oh yeah, you need to live this way. You should talk this way in order to, you know, boost your status, like fit in with our friend group. I think of things like celebrities, right, that we look to, that we think, oh yeah, they've got like the lifestyle, they know what they're doing, they, they know their purpose, and we look to them, we're like, oh yeah, I'm really struggling with my, my life, like what my purpose is, what I'm, what I'm doing here, like I'm going to look to like, you know, this person or this person. Or we go to, again, like social media or different platforms of people to build us confidence, like when we're struggling with our confidence in who we are, Right? We tend to go to things of this world that, that give us and say like, yeah, like I know, what, I know what you're struggling through. Like this is what you need to have more confidence in yourself. Or we go to things like Hallmark to figure out how to date or who to pursue, like all these different things. Never go to Hallmark, never. Don't go to Hallmark. Uh, right? There's all these different things in this world that act and, and seem almost like Apple support, act and seem as if they know the answer to the struggles that we're facing, to things that we're going through. You know, the thing about these types of counsel, these types of guidance in the world is that once we go to them and they give us these solutions and these things that are supposed to help us, we pretty quickly realize that they actually fail us and they actually don't know what they're talking about. And it actually does not bring a solution to the problem that we have. And then they pass us off or the organization or the social media platform, the person they pass off to another person who does the same. It's like this ongoing, like, false counsel that we face all the time in our life that I know each of you guys have here faced in your life, right? When, when we go to social media and it tells us to do this, to post this way, to build more confidence, we realize very quickly that, wow, I'm now stuck because now I feel the need to post and do all this and present myself in this way that actually is making me feel less confident in myself because I feel a need to keep posting. And the moment I get less likes on my photo, then I feel less confident about myself. Right, we go to, and we listen to friends in our schools who tell us this is what you need to do to like have worth in our friend. This is what you need to do to build up social status. And then you try to do that and you fail at living up to what they say, oh, this is the standard you have to meet. And then you just feel less worthy of friends' approval. Right, you go to things like, again, looking to celebrities or whatever, and you're like, oh, that's the lifestyle I need to live. But then you realize that living a lifestyle of materialism, of self-satisfaction, of self-pleasure, living for yourself, actually doesn't make you feel more happy in life, but it's just draining. All these different things in this world, the, the common thread that they all hold is that it doesn't actually fix our issue doesn't bring resolution to our struggles. You know, the source of the counsel, the, tr the truth about all these sources is that the source of the counsel, whether it be a person or an organization or a platform, whatever it may be, whatever you guys are facing, the truth is that it's all really lost. They actually don't know these people, these organizations, they don't know why they exist because they don't know the God who created them. They don't know the true purpose of life because they don't know who even established the purpose of life. They've just created it themselves and they're trying to dish it off to other people like they know best. And yet, if you were to really ask them, they really don't. They think they know who we are and who you ought to be 
and yet they don't know the God who created us and who knows us better than anybody else. Right? They're, at the end of the day, lost. They don't know the solution, and they're trying to provide solutions to people to you without even having a true knowledge of what it is themselves. And so whenever we go to these worldly councils, whenever we go to these different things, we're listening to counsel from a person or organization or a platform, whatever it may be, that is utterly lost and void of real truth. That's ultimately what we're doing. It's almost like going through like the Chick-fil-A drive-through and saying, hey, I got this check engine line in my car. Do you think you could help me out here? Like I really need some, like Chick-fil-A guy's not gonna know how to fix your car. He's there to serve you chicken. That's what he knows how to do. And, he, and they do it really good. Might, might as well say. Uh, Right, where we're going to these people in these places that aren't equipped to handle the situations that we're going through. That I know a lot of you guys here in this room, all of us, are wrestling through and are going through. You know, our passage tells us an amazing truth this morning that Jesus is our wonderful counselor. What that means is that Jesus is not just another voice in your life to listen to. He's not just another voice, but Jesus is the voice that you should be listening to in your life. Because why? Because he knows you better than anybody else knows you in this entire world. Jesus actually defined the reason for your existence. Jesus knew you before you were even born. He knew exactly who you ought to be in relation to how he created you. And Jesus knows everything about everything. This is the voice that Jesus offers us. This is the baby Jesus that we're celebrating this Christmas, right? Who came down this world, who was born in this world and was called, prophesied, foretold that his name shall be called the Wonderful Counselor because his voice would be like none like anybody else's. You know, Jesus' counsel was unlike any other teachings in this entire world, in the entire history of the world, right? We think of Jesus' teaching in the gospel. He taught that it is more blessed to give than to receive, He taught to rejoice and to be glad when you're faced with trials and persecution and struggles. Rejoice, be glad. He taught to love our enemies. The people who hate us, who we hate as well, if we're being honest, he taught us to love them and to do good to them. And he also taught that whoever would give up their life, would lay down their life, would actually receive life. Jesus fulfilled his name as our wonderful counselor throughout his life because he struck at the the worldly wisdom and the worldly teaching and and proved in all of these crazy teachings that he actually knew what he was talking about. And it was the wisest and most wonderful counsel ever known to man because these teachings have proved for for thousands of years that that those who turn and listen to Jesus' voice, that it actually does bring them the joy that they're looking for. It brings them the confidence, the the trust, the self-worth, the purpose that they're looking for. For hundreds of years, that's occurred in people's lives because of listening to this voice. You know, I don't think it'd be wrong for me to say that a majority of us here actually struggle with listening to Jesus' voice above the world's. Of all the other things in the world that I just mentioned— And so my question for you guys here this morning that I said I would bring up is just simply what is keeping you back from seeing Jesus' opinion on your struggles and your questions and life decisions as the best opinion? What's keeping you back from going to Jesus with these answers and these struggles? You know, when was the last time that you actually went to God's word or you went to God in prayer or you went to a friend or somebody you know who would point you to Jesus and his voice when you were faced with a struggle? When was the last time you actually went to the wonderful counselor? Right, why are we so quick to turn to all of these false counselors of this world for their wisdom when we know that from experience, every time we do that, we just get burned and we just feel less of what we want more and just keep getting passed off to another counselor, to another counselor, to social media, to a friend at school, to whatever it may be. Why do we keep going to those places? Now, what do you think it would look like if starting today, you actually chose to listen to Jesus' voice above any other voice in your life to make him your wonderful counselor? 
What changes to your life do you think would be made if you actually listened to his voice above all else? How would the way that you view yourself change if you took Jesus' voice as truth rather than your friends at school? You know, Jesus is our wonderful counselor and he desires above all else for you to cling to him and to listen to his voice because it is the best thing for you. Psalm 1, 1 through 3 says this. It says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, or Jesus' voice. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruits in season, and its leaf does not wither. And in all that he does, he prospers. This is a reflection of the the man and the woman who goes to Jesus' voice above all else. Jesus is our wonderful counselor. Now that's not all, right? Isaiah gives us three more. So we got three more names to get through here, right? Jesus is not only our wonderful counselor, not only the only voice that we should get to, but Jesus is actually God with us. Jesus is God with us. This is the second point you guys can write down here. And we get this from Isaiah saying, he is, he shall be called wonderful counselor and he shall be called mighty God. You know, this may be the most prominent names in my opinion on this entire list. This is just, again, my opinion. I think it's the most prominent name of all of these names. Because remember these names, they're not just names that are given to Jesus, but these are names that Jesus actually fulfilled, that he actually proved himself to be. And here we see, again, Isaiah say that this, this baby shall be called the mighty God. He's simply stating that this baby boy will be God with us. He's saying that he will be called God because he will be God. This is God in the flesh. And we know this to be true because Jesus proved himself to be this throughout his life. Right Throughout Jesus' life, he built up followers. He, he called disciples. He performed miracles and healings, proved himself to have a divine nature, brought many people following after him, while at the same time stirring up this other group of people, these Jews or Pharisees or Sadducees, whatever you want to call them, who hated Jesus, who hated him because they thought that he was, blasph- he was blasphemous, that he claimed to be God, and yet they did not believe him to be God. And eventually, that stirring of that people got them to uh, eventually, as we know, right, bring or, or, or almost like steal one of Jesus' followers, Judas, and get him to betray Jesus. And then they captured Jesus, they arrested him, and brought him before this council. And in Matthew 26, we see this event take place. It says that, and the high priest, right, Jesus is before all of these, these uh, Pharisees, and it says, the high priest said to Jesus, I adjure you by the living God, Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand and of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witness do we need? You have heard this blasphemy here. What is your judgment? They answered, He deserves death. But the Pharisees when Jesus made his statement back, they understood exactly what he was saying when he used the phrase, son of God, when he indirectly claimed it to be of himself. They understood that to be the son of God was actually to be the same nature of God. Therefore, to claim to be the son of God actually was claiming to be of God and of God himself. And so they caused this uprising because they saw Jesus. They, he was claiming to be God in the flesh, and they did not believe him to be so. And so they caused this uprising, which then led to Jesus' crucifixion. And yet, one of, I think, the most impactful moments of Jesus' entire crucifixion that we see in Matthew 27, just a chapter later in the, the Gospel of Matthew, takes place in this. It says, Matthew 27, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness. Right, This is right after Jesus breathe his last breath. There was darkness over all land until ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, yielding up his spirit, dying on the cross. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And it goes on to say, when the centurion and those who were near him, who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the son of God. This was the son of God, the, the son of God in which whom he claimed to be. You know, people witnessing this death couldn't help to see, couldn't help but to see that Jesus was not just a man. That he was not even just a man who claimed to be God, but Jesus truly was God in the flesh. He was the mighty God coming down to be with us. Jesus was seen by many at this moment to be that mighty God in which was prophesied, that they all knew was prophesied of him hundreds of years prior to this moment. Yeah, I think the best part is yet to, yet to come. When Jesus not only has died on the cross, rose again three days later, proving himself to be God, but he ascended into heaven and he's promised to come back and to take us home to be with him, the mighty God. Right, the yet, the best part is yet to come. Right, looking back at our passage, it says this about this baby Jesus. Because when he comes back, he's gonna be a king. He's gonna be a ruler. He is going to be a judge. And our passage speaks to that. It says that the government shall be upon his shoulder and of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. This is the magnitude of, of Jesus' might as God himself in the flesh with us. He is God who is sovereign in control of all the situations of your life. He can do the impossible when you bring requests to him. He can heal. He can defeat enemies on, on our behalf in this world. And he can accomplish all things that you may simply attribute just to God. Right? We see God as God is the one who can do these things, but Jesus himself was God and everything that we would picture that God can do in our life, Jesus can do because he was God in the flesh. So back to my running question for you this morning. What do you think it would look like if you let the mighty God, if you let Jesus be the God of your life? Now, I'm not just talking for the first time because a lot of you may say, yep, I have a relationship with God, but what would it look like for Jesus to truly be all of the aspects of God in your life today? Do you actually live as if Jesus is the mighty God? The one you can go to and help for trouble? The one you can, who can do the impossible through your prayers? Or the one who created you and can give you worth and value? Do you actually live as if Jesus is your mighty God? Because that's who he is. That's who he proved himself to be. Now, not only is God our wonderful counselor, whose voice is more prominent than any others in our life, not only is he God in the flesh, but Jesus also provides us unending fatherly love to us. He provides unending fatherly love to us. To us, And we see this in the third name that Isaiah gives. He says, he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, and Eternal Father. Now for my theologians out here, this, this term isn't actually meaning uh, that first person in the Trinity, right? I think initially your minds might go to, oh, oh he's, he's claiming to be God the Father, right? The first person of the Trinity. But this term in Isaiah is actually speaking to the father-like role and figure that Jesus plays in our life. That's what he's speaking to here. Now, uh, I've got an illustration for us. My wife and I, we've been watching this, uh, this show called Little House on the Prairie. How many of you guys are familiar? Yeah, there we go. Got my homeschool homies out there watching that Little House on the Prairie. Uh, and, and one of my favorite characters in this show, uh, it's about like this like old school family. It, it, was, it was a show that came out a long time ago. There were also books and such uh, about this real life family um, who lives on this prairie, and, and two of the main characters are Laurel Ingalls, 
or Laura Ingalls, and then uh, Charles Ingalls. And I actually have a photo of Charles if you want to toss it up on the screen. This is my guy, Charles, okay? I'm all about Charles Ingalls. Yeah, you guys are big Charles Ingalls fans, yeah. And you know, I like to call Charles, like, in my mind, he's like the goat of all fathers. Like this guy, if you guys have seen the show or read the books, like this guy protects, he cares for, he serves, he leads, he loves, and he cherishes his family in like a legit way. Like there's scenes in this show where like his daughters are like captured by these, by, by these guys who like take them in captivity. He like bursts down the door, comes in like, like just knocks all the guys unconscious, like saves his daughters. There's times where like his son like brings like the most like difficult circumstance to him. This is one of the recent episodes of my wife and I watched, it was sad. Uh, and, and like Charles just gives like the best counsel, like fatherly advice. There's times where like you just see Charles, like he's just working his butt off to provide for his family. It has like nothing, right? And every single day he's working and he's working at this like mill. Uh, that's like one of my favorite scenes when Charles is like doing the wood, you know, it's kind of cool. Uh, sorry, I'm like nerding out here. Uh, you guys may think we're just like old people at home watching this show. Uh, but like he's, he works hard to provide for his family to put food on the table. Like this guy is a legit father. Now, this is just Charles Ingalls from the show, right? He was though a real person. My wife makes sure to have me say that he was a real person. Uh, but in the show, right, that's just who they portrayed him to be. And you know, though Charles Ingalls is an amazing picture of what a father figure should look like in her life, I'm sure many of us here, as I'm just talking about this, probably have not have, had an experience with a father-like figure such as this in your life. Maybe that'd be the person that you hoped would be that father-like figure in your life has failed you time and time again. Or maybe that father figure has just never been present in your life. I know there's some of you here in this room who, who can resonate with that. But this is the amazing thing about Jesus is that he is our eternal father. He's greater than any other father figure in your life that you would have hoped to be that father figure or maybe that wasn't even existent in your life. Jesus is our eternal father. Jesus' fatherly love and provision and protection, it's unfailing and it lasts forever. It's even more perfect than Charles Ingalls himself. He is the much greater and a much perfect and more powerful father figure in our life. And Jesus exemplified this care for the lowest of people, right? In, his, in the gospel, we see Jesus provide the most tenderly and gentle care for the lowest of people. We saw Jesus provide food for, and, and th for thousands of people throughout his lifetime. We see Jesus love those around him, young and old, as if he, they were his own children, which in a sense they were. Jesus proved himself to be the perfect and best father figure known to man. Jesus is our everlasting father, which means he will remain in our life forever. And he will be this, in this role forever, not temporarily. Jesus is everlasting father in that he will remain in our life even when the father figure that we hoped would remain in our life disappears. Right? Unlike that father that you hoped would be in your life, or maybe, maybe it is your father, or maybe, maybe it's a father that wasn't existing in your life, or maybe it's that person who uh, you hoped would be that father figure in your life, even after they've failed you, or left you, or been non-existent, which they will, because every other father in this world is imperfect, even Charles Ingalls. Jesus, he's our everlasting father. He remains the same and consistent forever as the perfect father who protects, pr provides, guides, and loves you forever. This is who Jesus wants to be in your life. What do you think it would look like if you let Jesus as the everlasting father be the most prominent father figure in your life moving forward? What do you think would change? If you replace that role that you've been hoping for over here your whole life that a father figure would fill, what if you replace that with Jesus and said, Jesus, I want you to be my everlasting father. What changes in your life do you think would be made if you sought after Jesus' protection and provision and care? How would Jesus' fatherly discipline change the behaviors 
that you're currently doing behind doors? How would Jesus as your father figure change the way you view yourself, change the way you live? This is who Jesus is. He's our eternal father. It's who he proved himself to be and it's who he still is to this day. Now, not only is Jesus a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, our everlasting father, there's one more name that Jesus was given, that he would be called our prince of peace. Right, we see Isaiah say this. He says, his name shall be called the prince of peace. Now, though I said Jesus as mighty God, in my opinion, would be the most prominent of all these names, I just want to take a moment here to say that I think Jesus being the Prince of Peace might just be the most applicable and important name for some of you here in this room. Might be just the most important name for some of you here in this room to consider. Because the peace in this name of Jesus, it's not referring to any normal kind of peace that this world offers that maybe you would, your mind would jump to. This piece isn't one, it is one that goes beyond the comfort of knowing that all your homework this week is complete and you finish that essay and that assignment, you're like ready to turn in. I know you juniors are out, you're like, I just turned my like junior project and I'm like dying. Right, this piece is, is beyond that. It's beyond that, that feeling of like, oh, all of the conflict and everything with friends, like there's, there is no conflict, like I'm good, like I have good relationship with all my friends at school. It's beyond that. It's beyond that relaxing feeling of sitting by the fire with your cozy blanket and your hot chocolate. Right, all of these different things we think peace is, this peace that Jesus offers is not that kind of peace. It's far greater than that peace. The peace that this name is speaking to and the peace that Jesus offers is the peace between us and God who created us. It's the deeper, more foundational meaning of peace, which is the spiritual harmony that's brought about by an individual, by our restoration to God. Let me say that one more time. The peace that Jesus offers is the spiritual harmony brought about by an individual, by our restoration to God. That's the kind of peace that we're talking about here. I'm talking about the peace that, that Jesus went to the cross to offer to us. God sent Jesus because he so loved us that he would die on the cross for our sins, the things that we have shattered peace between God, right? We all have sinned in our life. We've broken the peace between God because of the things that we've done against him. And yet Jesus came to die on the cross to take upon our sin on himself, die and rise again so that anybody who would trust in him can receive again that peace and harmony with God. That's the peace that Jesus brings. You know, as I'm talking, some of you guys here do not have that peace. If you guys are being honest with yourselves, some of you here this morning do not have that kind of peace. You've been seeing Jesus as like, oh, that comfort cozy person that I can just like bring into my life. Or seeing Jesus as just that person who, you know, like I, I claim to be a Christian, I claim to be a follower of Jesus because my parents do, my friends do, like I go to Christian school, all these different things. But you don't actually have that peace with God. His voice is not present in your life as the wonderful counselor, right? You've never seen or believed him to be God, the mighty God in your life. You've never seen him that way. And he's never been that father-like figure in your life. You've never seen him in that light, and he's never been that. And most importantly, maybe you're sitting here as we've been walking through these different names of Jesus and you're like, oh, like sensing that he's never been that in my life. He's never been that in my life. He's not that in my life. Maybe more importantly, you're now realizing that he's never brought me peace in relationship with God. I don't have that peace that he offers. He's not my Prince of Peace. You know, if that's you and, and that's something that's just stirring in your heart right now, then I hope that you would not ignore that. That you would listen to that and I hope receive the invitation, receive the gift that Jesus has to offer you. And that's the peace that we're talking about. Jesus has that to offer to you as a free gift and I hope you would not ignore that, but I hope you would respond. 
Because Jesus as our Prince of Peace, he simply calls us to, if, if we want that kind of peace, he simply calls us to recognize our sins before him. Say, God, I realize I have sin in my life that has been against you. And trust in Jesus, trust in his death on the cross to count for the penalty of your sin and forgive you of everything to be in an everlasting relationship with him. That's all Jesus simply asks of us is to acknowledge our sin and to trust in him. And the amazing thing about that is that when we do that, he then becomes that wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, and the prince of peace. Not for one time peace, but for peace for the rest of our life and forevermore. You know, I hope that this Christmas, again, if that's you, you would receive the greatest gift of all time. And that's not a gift that's, that can be found in this like box that's all sparkly with a bow tied on top. But it's a gift that can only be found in a person, Jesus. Now, I haven't forgotten about our passage in Luke. So if you guys still have your Bibles with me, let's turn there. Luke chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. So like I said, these four names were prophesied about Jesus like 800 years in advance, right? Prophesied that this is who he would be. And Jesus fulfilled those names in his life. And now we get a glimpse in Luke chapter two of all of that prophecy being fulfilled. So Luke chapter two, verses 10 through 14, shows us 800 years in advance from the passage that we just read a little bit ago. And it talks about how there were a group of random shepherds walking around in this field and an angel appeared to them. And it says in verse 10 that the angel said, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. And for unto you is born, just like Isaiah, unto us will be born this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a great multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those whom he is pleased. This is the promise. This is the prophecy, the fulfilling of what brings us confidence that Jesus is our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, our everlasting father, and our prince of peace. We know without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was not only foretold to come into this world and be these things, but he actually was born and he grew and lived a life to fulfill each and every one of those names that we just talked about this morning. And above all else, he provided us great joy. He says, this baby will bring you great joy. He has, he is here, and he will bring you great joy for all people. And he will also bring us great peace in a relationship with God. This is what it means for Jesus to be our Emmanuel, to be God with us, to be our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, our everlasting father, our prince of peace. It's not just a baby that we're worshiping this season. It's not just, oh yeah, cute little baby Jesus. But this is the God of the universe. This is the voice that we are to listen to. This is the father figure in our life. And this is the peace giver, all wrapped up in this humble baby in a manger. You know, I hope that as we were just talking through these things, that everything that we just talked about would bring so much more weight to that word, Emmanuel. When you sing that in church, when you guys pray about that with your family, maybe, maybe you just hear about that. I hope that everything we just talked about brings so much more weight to that word. You know, from these four names of Jesus, I wanna ask you guys this question. Which one do you feel like this morning you need to believe and to cling to the most? Out of those four names, what do you think which one of those is one that you need to cling to and believe the most this morning? Do you need to cling to Jesus as your wonderful counselor, seeing that you've been seeking the voices of so many different things in your life and listening to their counsel rather than to Jesus's? Do you need to cling to him as your mighty God who is mighty to do great things in your life 
if you bring requests to him, if you seek him as the God who is sovereign over your life? Do you need to cling to him as your everlasting father who will bring you provision, protection, and guidance, and love perfectly this Christmas as you maybe go into a messy Christmas with your family or through the situation that whatever you may be facing, do you need him as that everlasting father in your life? Or do you simply need to cling to Jesus as your prince of peace, as your savior who will bring you for the first time in your life into a genuine relationship with God? Which of these four roles do you need to cling to the most this Christmas? And whatever that may be, I want you guys to write it down. I don't don't want you guys to forget about that. I want you guys to write it down on your notes or whatever you need to do to remind yourself, what is that one name? Just write down those two words. That one name that you need to cling to the most this Christmas. And I would just say for those of you, just as we wrap up, if you just wrote down that, that you want Jesus to be your Prince of Peace, if, that's, if those are the two words that you just wrote down or thinking of in your mind or put down on your phone, whatever it may be, I, I hope that you would not just ignore that, but that you would go talk to somebody about that. And, it, and if you'd be so willing or wanting, we have leaders all throughout this room. Uh, we got Henty and Josh, myself and Hannah and, and everybody in this room. We would love to have a conversation with you. If you wrote down that Jesus, you want him to be your Prince of Peace, you want to step in a relationship with God forever and trust in him, we'd love to talk with you if you want uh, to just walk you through next steps of what that looks like. So please don't ignore that. Come find with us. You can find me. I'll be up here at the end uh, in a second as I pray, and, and we would just love to talk with you about that. To end us off, I just want to leave us with our main idea. If you were to get anything out of everything we just talked about, if you guys were falling asleep this whole time, I would just simply say that Jesus wants to be present in your life and he wants to bring change as a result of these four names that he proved himself to be. He wants to be with you. He wants to be present in your life and and he wants to be your wonderful counselor, your mighty God, your Prince of Peace, and your everlasting Father. And this happens, again, the moment in which we trust in him for the first time. And we cling to him more and more as these roles in our life. So I hope you guys would cling to him in these four names this Christmas. Let's pray. God, I just thank you so much, Lord, that you are not a God who just left us in our despair and in our sin. Because God, we all know if we're being honest that that's where we were. God, thank you for not leaving us in that place. Thank you for pursuing us and loving us so much so that you would die for us. God, that is the greatest Christmas that, that, that is the greatest gift that we could ever receive this Christmas. So Lord, I pray that just as we're unwrapping our little gifts and dumping out our stockings, that Lord, as we just see and, and, and experience these worldly gifts, God, that we would just be reminded for a second of the greatest gifts that, gift that we have been ever offered, and that's a relationship with you through Jesus Christ. God, I pray that you would just reveal yourself in these four names to the students today. God, as they have just seen you in a new light, as they, they see who Jesus, you, you proved to be, God, I pray that whatever they wrote down on their paper, whatever they're thinking of, God, or, or ways in which, Lord, they want you to be that role in their life more. God, I pray that you would be that in their life, and God, that you would show them how, how you are that, Lord, through your word in their life. And God, I just pray that you'd help their hearts to trust in you as that, to believe you as that, and put you in that place in their life today for the rest of their life. God, we thank you for being who you are. We thank you for your love for us. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.